In ninth grade, we are continuing our read of Into the Clouds, and we're getting very close to the end. I think we have about 45, 50 pages left, maybe. And we are on chapter 15, In the Eye of the Storm. And if you remember, they were hoping for some good weather. They're always hoping for good weather on K2, <laughs> and it doesn't always happen. So we're on page 174, chapter 15, In the Eye of the Storm. Five miles below Camp 8 and 800 miles to the south, a mass of warm, wet air churned inland from the Indian Ocean. For days to come, winds would push the warm air north through India and Pakistan until it ran against the high walls of the Himalaya and billowed upward. As the warm air rose, it would cool, condense, and transform into the worst monsoon storms the young nation of Pakistan had ever seen. On the night of August 2nd, this rolling storm front slipped across the southern edge of the Himalaya and bore down on K2. At Camp 8, the last climbers had just staggered up the snow slope and into camp. Molinar celebrated their arrival in his diary that night. Party again together, he wrote, wonderful. The next morning, the sky was a sickly gray and the wind blew with a vengeance. But Charlie Houston was feeling good. At this point on the mountain, Wisner had been alone with Dudley Wolf and Pasang Kakuli. Below him was a broken chain of debilitated teammates and frightened Sherpas. Houston, on the other hand, had made it to 25,000 feet with his party intact. Never before had an entire mountaineering team climbed this high. The four tents at Cap 8 sat in a rectangle, doors facing the center. As the wind raged, the team managed to hold a conference and hatch a plan. Tomorrow, Tuesday, six climbers would move as high as they could and establish Camp 9. Two would stay there and try for the summit the next day. Meanwhile, four climbers would move back up from 8 with more supplies. A new party of two would stay and try for the summit on Thursday. On Friday, the entire team would head down the mountain, successful or not. Molinar listened to it all and couldn't help feeling nervous. The altitude had given him a splitting headache and a queasy stomach. The weather had been unpredictable at best and the supplies wouldn't last forever. If they got a window of clear skies, shouldn't they use it to get off the mountain? As he huddled with his diary that night, the tent snapping and pulling at its rope, Molinar worried that they were letting pride get in the way of good sense. His mind drifted to Seattle, 9,000 miles away, where the things he often found irritating suddenly seemed like a joy. What he wouldn't give right now to go shopping with Lee and Patty, to live the wonderful life ahead in which no such material summits force one's pride and ego into battle, in which it can be a real fine experience to realize that one needn't always be on top. That night, the top was the last thing on Charlie Houston's mind. He sat shoulder to shoulder with George Bell praying they would survive the night. A violent gust of wind swept the tent and tore a small hole in the nylon wall. With the next onslaught, another rip, to, rip appeared. Houston and Bell drifted in and out of sleep, the holes growing larger every time they opened their eyes. Bell was calm as always, but it was terrifying how vulnerable they were. Just a thin layer of nylon between them and a wind so fierce it could blow a man off his feet. Should we get out of this tent now and make a dash for the others? Houston asked. 
I think we'll last till daylight, Belle said. That was all they could hope. Finding boots and gathering gear in the dark seemed like more than they could handle. If they had to go out in the gale, even just to pile into another tent, Houston thought they might not survive. If the tent collapsed, they decided, they would huddle in the wreckage until the sun broke through. Finally, around 7 o'clock a.m., the wind delivered its final blow. The tent poles snapped in three places and the nylon collapsed around them like a net. Our tent's gone, they yelled. Houston and Belle wriggled out of their sleeping bags and groped for their boots. When the wind let up for a moment, they crawled free of the tattered shelter and scrambled for the other tents. Houston dove in with Strether and Bates, Bell squeezed between Molinar and Craig. The tents already made a crowded home for two people. Now they would have to accommodate three. In Houston's tent, they could barely sit up. To Strether, it felt like living under a cot with two other men. For now, it was the only choice they had. For days, the wind and snow refused to let up. The Sherpas talked about the mountain as though it were a living spirit, and Bates now understood what they meant. Science was the tool he'd always used to understand nature, but out here, it was inadequate. The wind was so fierce that it seemed to blow with evil intent, as though they had awakened a spirit that was trying to blast them off the mountain. During the worst spells, Bates, Strather, and Houston leaned on the windward side of the tent, trying to hold it down from the inside. After each brutal gust, they yelled to the next tent over, okay, okay, came the answer. But no one was really okay. All the tents had gapes in them now, and the wind easily found a way in. They spent hours huddled around the stoves, trying to keep the flame from sputtering out. Most of the time, they failed. They went days without a hot meal and barely enough melted snow or a cup of tea. They survived on biscuits, jam, and meat bars. In the meager shelter of the tents, they did what they could to keep themselves occupied. Bates read poetry to his teammates. Houston fantasized out loud about his vacation spot beside a rippling lake in the Adirondack Mountains. Like prisoners planning their escape, they talked constantly about the summit. On August 5th, they held a vote to pick the summit teams. As soon as they could climb, Craig and Bell would go first. Shonen and Gilkey would follow the next day. When the weather allowed, Houston made his rounds from tent to tent checking for signs of frostbite, trying to keep spirits high. Molinar was always glad to see him. Somehow, in the face of it all, Houston stayed cheerful and energetic. For Houston, there was one ritual he couldn't live without. Every day at 7 o'clock a.m. and 6 o'clock p.m., he dug in his sleeping bag where he kept the radio so its batteries wouldn't freeze. He clicked the button and spoke. Hello, base camp. Hello, base camp. This is camp set eight. Can you hear me? Over. Without fail, the cheerful voice of Colonel Atta Ula came back to him. Hello, Charlie. I hear you very well. Give me your news, please. Over. Well, Atta, the storm keeps on up here. There's nothing to see and we can't get out. But we are fighting fit and ready to go. What is your news? Over. Charlie could hear the reluctance in Atta's voice when he answered. The colonel was desperate to tell them something hopeful, but day after day the news was the same. Fresh snow at base camp, the peaks shrouded in dark clouds, more heavy snow and high winds forecast for 25,000 feet. It wasn't what Charlie wanted to hear but the sound of Atta's voice scratching through the speaker gave him strength. Somewhere beneath the clouds, there were other human beings waiting for them to come back to Earth. Thousands of miles away in Seattle and Exeter and Iowa, Lee Molinar, Dorcas Houston, and Art Gilkey's parents 
waited eagerly for news of the expedition. As far as they knew, the team was doing fine. Gilkey's parents had gotten letters from Art until he left Scardu. Since then, their only news came from the AAC, and it was usually two weeks old. The team wrote regular updates, but the letters had to be carried by runner to Ascole before they started their journey across the ocean. In July, a reporter from the Des Moines Tribune had asked Art's father if he worried about their son. What's the use, Herbert Gilkey said. It's what the boy wants to do. His heart is so much in it, we couldn't want it otherwise. Of course, we know the hazards that are there, a glacial slide, a storm, but things can happen to you crossing the street too. On August 6th, several papers ran small articles on the progress of the expedition. U.S. climbers move up K2, read a headline in the Newport Daily News. Reports brought by runners said the team was in the best of health and spirits, the article claimed. By the time the article appeared on the morning newsstands, darkness was falling over K2, half the world away. The climbers hadn't moved up or down in nearly a week, and their health could not be described as good. Charlie Houston made his rounds early in the day and discovered that George Bell and Dee Molinar were done. Now Bell lay in a sleeping bag, wiggling his toes to get feeling back in his feet. Already the flesh on two of his toes had begun to die. Black gangrenous spots were sp spreading through his feet. Sandwiched in the tent next to Bell, Molinar was also struggling with frostbite. He hadn't had much to eat or drink in days and his throat hurt every time he swallowed. He and Bell were supposed to descend tomorrow if the weather allowed. But the biggest blow to the fortunes of the third American Karakoram expedition was yet to come. In a few hours, as the sun lightened the sky over the mountain, Art Gilkey would collapse in the snow and Houston would make another discovery. Gilkey had blood clots in his legs. The kid whose heart was so much in it that he wanted more than any of them to stand at the top of K2 was going to die on the mountain if they could not get him down. Well, we'll stop there, page 182. And our next chapter will be Chapter 16, not a promising title. The title of the chapter is The Death Zone. Thank you so much for listening, ninth grade students. Look forward to our next read and take care of yourselves. Bye.